So, so far we have been studying about uh, graph embedding problem. So we want to embed sparse graph H into dense graph G. And we want to find the condition on G. So far, uh, what we have considered is when H is sufficiently smaller than G. So at first, we consider the fixed size H and large G. And then we consider the I mean, n vertex graph G and some epsilon n vertex graph H when epsilon is certain constant. So from now on, we will go to a more larger graph. So we will consider the case when H actually has the same number of vertices as G. <coughs> so, so we want to show that the certain, I mean, for certain graph H, which has n vertices, and we want to find some condition to, I mean, embed H into G. So what would be the simplest graph H we can consider? So if H has some isolated vertices, then we might as well just forget it, and we can assume H is smaller. So it makes sense to think about the case when H doesn't have any isolated vertex. So most simplest case is when H is a matching. Say n vertex matching, so which is different union of edges. <coughs> and what would be the condition on G so that we can embed this graph, this n vertex graph, into an n vertex graph G? So, so far we have studied the condition on the number of edges in G. However, if in this case, if we consider this graph H and we want to guarantee, embed, guarantee an embedding into G, we can consider some graph like, so this is K sub N minus 1 and one isolated vertex. Then it contains lots of edges. The number of edges here is uh, actually N minus 1 choose 2 which is maximum minus M, M minus 1, so which has density almost 1. But it is clear that uh, we cannot hope for an embedding of this into here. Because there is this one vertex, and there is no way that uh, no vertex here can map into here. Because in that case, edge maps into non-edge. So if we consider large graph H, which has same number of vertices in G, this number of edges does not make much sense anymore. So, because of this example, so if some vertex has degree 0 or degree 2 low, then that's not good for our, I mean, problem of this large graph embedding. So instead of E on G, it makes sense to consider the condition on minimum degree of G. So, from now on, we will mainly focus on the conditions on minimum degree of G, which guarantees certain subgraph H. So, for example, this complete graph, I know, the matching, perfect matching. So, in the perfect matching case, there is this well-known theorem, which by Hall. So, Hall theorem says that if we have a bipartite graph, H, no, not H, G, <coughs> so suppose that G is a bipartite graph, with partition, vertex partition, A and B, and if for all subgraph A prime of A, we have, we consider the neighborhood of this vertex A prime. Here, because we used N, the neighborhood of certain set as a common neighborhood before, so to distinguish it, we put one here, which is a collection of vertices whose distance is one from A prime. So this is, so if we 
However, this A prime in any vertex which has at least one edge here are, I mean, con are included here. If it has size bigger than A prime, yeah, bigger than A prime, for all set, then she contains the matching. covering all vertices in A. So this is most well-known, very basic theorem regarding this large graph embedding. <coughs> so if this holds, then yeah, we can get perfect matches. As an exercise, you can use this theorem to prove that if we have a epsilon d bipartite, Epsilon D regular graph. Let's say A and B has both size N. And we have Epsilon D regular. And let's say Epsilon is bigger, smaller than 2 over D over N. Then, okay, would this graph contain perfect matching? Actually, that, is, that answer is no. Because so we know that the definition of epsilon d regular, right? Any not too small set, the density between them is always close to d. But that doesn't forbid, say, an isolated vertex. If there is one isolated vertex, then if we take, say, a prime and b prime, which has size at least epsilon n, the between the density, this one isolated vertex contributes very little. So this one vertex has very little effect. So whatever we do on this one vertex, it doesn't change the density on any sets A prime and B prime too much. So it doesn't actually forbid this isolated vertex. So it could, there could be some isolated vertex. So this doesn't contain perfect matching. However, if we forbid this, and we say that it's every vertex, say, every vertex of this G, so this is bipartite graph G, contains some, something like, say, dn over two neighbors, and then epsilon d regular, then it contains perfect matching. So you can actually use the definition of regular theorem to prove this. So basic idea is you take A prime, and then check this holds condition holds. So you consider three cases. When A prime is too small, or too big, or in the middle. So say it's smaller than dn over 2, and bigger than n minus dn over 2, and in the middle. In these two cases, so if it's too small or too large, you have to use its minimum degree condition. And in the middle, you can use the definition of epsilon regularity. You can do it yourself. So this kind of suggests that uh, this, so <coughs> in morning we show that, that this epsilon regularity structure is very useful for embedding graph. We prove embedding lemma, so that uh, we can use it to, for embedding problem of H into G when H is, I mean, smaller than G. So say some constant times number of N vertices in H and G has N vertices, then we can use this epsilon regularity structure to embed H into G. But this suggests that uh, maybe with some additional condition, we can use this structure for embedding n vertex graph into n vertex graph. That's exactly what we will do tomorrow, but not today. So, then back to the original question. So then, what would be the condition on G to guarantee a perfect matching in G. So embedding of this perfect matching into G. Actually, we don't use whole theorem anymore, so I will just delete it. <coughs> so actually, the answer is minimum degree n over 2. And actually, we can do better than that. Not only just H, we can actually embed more structure. So, Dirac theorem, classical theorem of Dirac says that 
if you have m vertex graph g, which satisfies its minimum degree at least n over 2, then g contains a Hamilton cycle. Here, Hamilton cycle is cycle past covering all the vertices. So in other words, Cn, the embedded into G. N vertex cycle embedded into G. So Hamilton cycle is cycle inside of G, which pass through all the vertices once and then come back to its position. So from this, we can directly say that if N is even, and G, G has minimum degree n over 2, then we can find the perfect matching. So in the Hamilton cycle, we alternate the edges. This edge, this edge, this edge, this edge, then we get a perfect matching. So let's, as a warm-up, let's prove this. So how do we prove it? So we have this minimum degree condition. Then first, it is easy to see that uh, G is connected. Because if you have a vertex X, vertex Y, then it's neighbor and X, neighbor of X, neighbor of Y. Must co uh, give me a moment. Does it have to coincide? Actually, it doesn't, but wait, does it have to be? Ah, yes. So there should be a common neighbor of these two. Yeah. Wait, is it? OK. M minus 1, N over 2, N over 2. Ah, yes. So it is easy to see that it is connected. Yeah. Then, OK. Let we choose the longest cycle. So maximal, uh, no, longest path. Maximal path which start from x1, x2, and say x of, what did I write here, s. So we have this p, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6. we want to show is that uh, we can, from this path, we can obtain a cycle covering all vertices, or we can get a longer cycle, a longer path. But by definition, this is the longest one, so we cannot get a longer path. That means we should get Hamilton cycle. So how do we do it is the, from the simple observation. So if we have edge here and edge here, then we get this cycle covering exactly the same vertex. And if there is a vertex outside, then because G is connected, there should be some, some way to reach here. Then we start from, say, here, and then we take one, one round and then we add this, then we get a longer path. So that's one observation. And another observation is because this is the longest path, all of its neighbors are inside. All of the neighbors are inside. It, it doesn't have any neighbor outside. And we have this minimum degree condition. So it has lots of neighbor, and it has lots of neighbor. So there should be some, so this is limited space, and it has lots of neighbor and lots of neighbor. So this incident should have, could, I mean, must happen. So that's the basic idea. So for that, we need to find this. So what we define is that in order to find this, we need to find i such that i has an edge here and i plus 1 has edge here. So let's consider all i between, say, 1 and s minus 1, so that i prime s plus 1 is a neighbor of x1. 
And then, at the same time, i itself, xi itself, is neighbor of x s. So if we find such i, then we can use the trick. And what is size? This and this. So what I wrote in, okay, yes. So out of s minus 1 indices, the one that satisfy this is at most, at least, n over 2. So the indices that, satis that doesn't satisfy this is at most this. So these are bad, bad indices. And here again, s minus 1 minus n over 2 are bad vertices, are bad indices. And out of all s minus indices, we subtract the bad indices and we subtract the bad indices, then leftover must be satisfying both conditions. Then that's n over 2 plus, so n over 2 plus n over 2 minus s minus 1 which is at least 1 because s is at most n. The path has size length at most n. So, there is this say k, which is in s minus 1, satisfying that the x1, x, x sub k plus 1 is in h, and xk, xs is on edge of g. Then, by this trick, we consider the cycle. C, which is x1, xk plus 1, xk plus 2, xs, and then xk, xk minus 1, da, 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 x1. So, which is exactly start from here and come here and coming back. So either C is Hamiltonian, C is a Hamilton cycle, or by connectivity of G. we get a longer cycle, longer path. Why do I keep saying cycle instead of path? Longer path. So, but because we assume this is longest path, so we get a Hamilton cycle. So that is the proof. So, this proves the both Hamilton cycle and the perfect matching. So tomorrow we will further generalize this theorem into more general structure than just cycle. But today let's focus more on the matching. <coughs> so another, so we prove this minimum degree condition of embedding matching into G, matching of the size, I mean n vertices. Then one generalization of matching. So if you consider matching, it's a bunch of different union of k sub 2, where k sub 2 is just an edge between two vertices. So one generalization is instead of k sub 2, we can consider k sub r, triangle. So we can consider different union of triangle or different union of k, k4. So this is natural graph to consider next. So if you want to embed this kind of thing into G, so this is H, then what minimum degree condition on G is sufficient for embedding such graph into G? So for convenience, let's define some concept called equitable coloring, which is, I mean, which is equivalent to this in, if we consider G complement. So remember, in first day, when we proved Turan theorem, we 
take the complement and we, instead of embedding complete graph, we consider finding independent set. So here, so we can do the similar trick. So define that the <coughs> we say a uh, coloring f of g from say some number k. So between one and k are the colors. Is an equitable coloring. You could always say K coloring. If it is proper coloring, and the sizes of color class are either floor of N over K or ceiling over n over k. So this is as even as possible. So this is proper coloring, and we use several colors: red color, blue color, green color. We color we count the number of red vertices, or blue vertices, green vertices, and they should be almost same, as same as as possible. So if we consider, say. Okay, so n over three copies of say triangle. So this is disjoint union of triangle. And embedding that to G, let's say n is divisible by three, then that is exactly the same problem as finding three equitable coloring of G complement. Three coloring. Because in this case, what we have is disjoint union of clicks in G. All of them have size 3. But in G complement, those were all complete graph in here, and in G complement, they are independent set. So this is partition of G, vertices of G, into n over 3 independent set, and each independent set has size 3. Then each independent set, we color it with the same color, same color, same color then we get coloring, which is proper, because each set is independent set. So all of these are red, then there is no edge between two red vertices. All of these are blue, then there are no edge between blue vertices. So that is proper coloring, and size of color classes are all same. So if we have results in equitable coloring, then we can flip the graph, and then we can obtain a result on embedding this disjoint union of clicks of the same size. So in that language, so we have this theorem, final already theorem. Which says that if we have an M vertex graph C with minimum degree less than k, strictly less than k, then there exists an equitable k coloring of g. What did I say? Less than k. Ah, sorry. Why did I write minimum degree? You are right. Maximum degree. Yes. So in, if we consider complement, in particular, what it implies is that if g prime is on m vertex graph with minimum degree g prime is at least 1 minus 1 over r times n, then g prime contains floor over n over r copies 
are vertex disjoint copies. Of K sub R. So those two are equivalent. So we will prove this theorem in the first, I mean, in the terms of the equitable coloring. <coughs> so, okay. Uh, Okay, we will define some terminology. So I will write definition here and proof here. So, so first, we say that uh, we may assume that what did I write here? N is multiple of K because if N is not multiple of K and we consider G and we add small click small complete graph and then we make it I mean the number of vertices divisible by k, and this, this complete graph has strictly smaller number than k. And then if we find the equitable coloring of this, then we get these color classes, we all have the exactly same size. And because this is complete graph, all the vertices are here, belong to here, at most one vertex here, one vertex here, one vertex here, one vertex here. So we delete them, then some so, some classes have one less size, some classes have ordinary size, still the older color classes almost e e as even as possible. So we may assume that the n is divisible by k. They are k. And we, what we do is we use induction. on M, which is number of edges in G. So we fix K. So K is fixed. For K, we will show that that holds. For any K, this is holds. And then we use induction on the number of edges in G. So if G is empty graph, it doesn't have edges at all, then this is trivially true. We just partition it. So base K is holds. So now we assume that uh, <coughs> we get a minimum counter example. Assume G is a minimum counter example. Then it means that uh, in G, if we delete one edge, then it has equitable coloring, K equitable coloring. And then we put it back that edge. If that edge is still crossing, so the, let's say we have U and V, and we delete an edge and we apply induction, we find the color classes. And if they don't belong to the same color class, then we are done. We already get a, I mean, the, the coloring we have is also good for G. If this has, this all belong, both belong to the same color class, then there are K color class. And this vertex has edge here. So one of the so if you take one vertex, it has neighbor here and neighbor here, and maybe no neighbor here, neighbor here. But if you consider the part which has neighbor, then that's strictly less than k. So there is all, at least one part this vertex doesn't have any neighbor. So we kick it out and we put it here. Then all of the classes have size R, except this has R plus one and this has R minus one. So we say that the F is near equitable coloring if color class 
has size r minus 1, r, r, and r, r plus 1. So we have this near equitable coloring for this graph G. Yeah. So it is not true if we have equality in the maximum degree. So we know that the Brooks theorem, so that the chromatic number itself is at most delta plus one, right? So yeah, there, there's, a, there's a graph which this, I mean, this delta plus one color strictly greater than the maximum degree color, even when we are just want to get the proper coloring. So that, I mean, cannot be relaxed. <coughs> So now what we define is for a near equitable coloring F, we define a directed graph. So a directed graph is graph and each edge is directed in one way or the other. Directed graph come from this near equitable graph F. And what this directed graph, so okay, let me say it this way. So we have, if we consider this near equitable coloring, we have this situation. We have R minus one vertex, R vertex, R vertices, R vertices, R plus one vertices. And what we want to do, it has one more vertex. So we take one vertex and we want to move it, move it to say here, then we are if that's possible, we are happy. But if that's not possible, what we want to do is we want to move it to somewhere else, and then here to somewhere else, and here to somewhere else, and then if that's possible, then we are also happy. So when does it, when is it possible? If this vertex has no neighbor here, then we can do this. And if there is one vertex which has no neighbor here, we can do this. And if there is a vertex which has no neighbor here, we can do this. So, if this is possible, then we are good. So we want to, so our aim, I mean, our main idea of proving this theorem is we want to find such sequences so that uh, we can move these vertices to here so that every class has the same size. And in order to encode this information, where to where we can move it, we use this diagram to encode this information. So, Diagram D consists of vertices, which is V1, A, V2, V sub R. So V sub K. So which is actually vertex bad, but we can consider it as a vertex of this auxiliary diagram. Auxiliary diagram. So, so F gives us this partition, V1, V2, V3. V sub K. And in this auxiliary graph, we consider that as a vertex in here. And we say that the V sub I to V sub J, the directed edge, is in e this diagram if and only if there is a vertex B in V sub I with uh, having no neighbors. In V sub J, that means there is a vertex we can move to V sub J. So we have this diagram, and then we assume that the V1 is the smallest and V K is the largest, and size of V1 is R minus 1, and size of VK is R plus 1. So, if we have a path in here which starts from VK and ends at V1, then we are done. But that's too hopeful, so we, that may not happen. Then, we need to distinguish some some 
vertices here. So some, this is vertex set, but vertices of this digraph. Some vertices which can, there is a path between that vertex and V1, then those are good. So we will call access, them accessible. And some of them doesn't have a path from that there to V1. We call them inaccessible. So it is good to distinguish those two. So we say that the uh, vertex, say, VI is, let's use some other color, accessible. If there is a path, directed path from VI to V1. And otherwise, inaccessible. And one other thing is that, uh, let's say, so we want to make some modifications, so V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, say, PK. And let's say in our modification, we moved one vertex from here to here, say. And then, before, let's say this vertex, I mean, so this vertex could move to here before, but now we add one vertex, and then this vertex and this vertex has an edge. Then by moving that, now no, we, we are not allowed to use it to here anymore. Right? So in that case, we want to also be careful about this situation. We want to move these vertices later, but by moving that, we can mess up some other situation. So we want to encode that information. So this happens because we touch something which is on its way to say, so initially, this vertex can go here, this vertex can go here, this vertex can go here. So there was path, but making some changes here can block this path. So we say that We say that VI blocks VJ if in this diagram, if we deleted this one vertex VI, this does not contain a path from VJ to V1. <coughs> And we say on accessible block is free if it does not block any vertex. So some of them is we say it is free. That means if we make some changes there, it doesn't screw up other situations because it doesn't block anything. So for example, if we have a path, so V1, V2, V3, V4, then V4 is free because it's at the end of path. Access over, what, what did I say? Access over vertex. Accessible class, what did I say in here? Class. Sorry. Yes. So these three, three classes are good because we can make some modification there without causing further problems. So now we define some, most of terminology. We will define two more terminology later. But So we can assume that situation is like this. We have V1, which contains R minus 1 vertices. And we put V2 
P2 and P3. And up until to say here, VA. And these are all accessible. And from here, VA plus 1, say, VA plus B, where A plus B is K. These are inaccessible. We can just shift what, whatever we want. The indexing is OK, so these are accessible. And among them, let's say V A minus A prime plus 1, V A minus A prime. So these are free. So A prime of them are free, and we put free vertices three classes here. And this is side R plus 1, and everything else has R. This is side R minus 1. And let A be the union of all accessible classes. And A prime be the union of all free accessible classes. And B is union of all inaccessible classes. So the, the union of the vertices. <coughs> now we, as moving one, as D prime might not have a, I mean, so B K might not be accessible. So. I mean, ideal case is if there is a directed path in D from PK to P1, then we move one, move one, move one, move one, move one, and we are good. But since that may not be true, we want to use the case. So let's say here this is Y, here this is X. Then what we want to do is we move Y first and then X later, right? But we cannot move Y yet, because there is an edge. But if we move X, then we are free to move Y. Right? In this case, we cannot move Y first and then X later. But we can move Y X first and Y later. So let's give some name to this case. Because this is useful. This, in this case, we cannot, I mean, at first glance, we, we assume that we cannot move. But it, actually, we can move as long as y has no other neighbors here. If x can go somewhere. So, we say that for on a vertex x in P sub i, so before giving the name of that edge, let's give name of x. Uh, we say that x is movable. If there is j to any accessible class, it's OK, such that X has no neighbor in P sub J. And now we give the edge to a name to that edge. And we say on edge XY with X in PI, which is in free. So here, as I mentioned, free, if we make the modification in free, we cause no problem. So we are, I mean, focusing our attention in the vertices in this free classes. <coughs> and y is in D, so the inaccessible is a solo edge. If y has only one neighbor in.
pi which is x <coughs> so as I mentioned before if this is solo at and x is movable ah yeah I forgot to mention one okay sorry so we assume one more so we assume f is so we show that uh, because the, we we assume the minimum counter example g has a nearly equitable coloring f and it may have more than one nearly equitable coloring right so among them we chose f which has the what did I Maximum number of accessible classes. Uh, did I write it here? Or did I forget to write here? Ah, yeah. yeah. Has the, say, fewest inaccessible, so which is the largest accessible classes. So among all <coughs> near repeatable coloring, which is the one with the uh, largest number of accessible classes and fewest number of inaccessible classes. Yep. So we assume that. And then we consider this picture. And here we show that uh, we define this movable and solo edge. <coughs> and as I mentioned before, if this is solo edge, this is solo edge and if this is movable, then instead of moving y first and x later, this is already movable. We move x first and then y later. So we will show that in that situation, if we have a solo edge with one end movable, then we are done. So we want to show that. <coughs> so claim. If xy is a solo edge with x in v sub i, which is free classes, all free class, and y is in vl, which is inaccessible class, and further x is movable. Then G has an equitable K color. <coughs> so what we want to do is so before the situation is that in this part we have R vertices, R vertices, R vertices, and R plus one vertices here. And here, I vertices, I vertices, I vertices, and I minus one vertices here. But if we move, say, one vertex to here and add y to here, then here, the number of vertices is multiple of L, R, and here, the, the <coughs> number of vertices is multiple of R. And to both are small, smaller graphs. So we assume that our minimum example is minimal. And then using some property of here, we can color this part and color this part separately. And then merge them together to obtain an equitable coloring for the entire graph. So that's our goal. So for that, let's so we, we have to use the induction hypothesis in here. And then here we use the I mean, property that this is movable and this is, <coughs> oh, yeah, this is solo edge. So because x is movable, there exists j, which is, in, which is not i, but still in this among accessible classes such that 
x has no neighbor in Vj. Then we move x to Vi and y to no x to Vj and y to Vi. So here to say x so Vj, we move it here and we move it here. Then we obtain a near equitable K coloring. No, not K coloring. Near equitable A coloring F prime of this G induced by A and Y. So here, we now have one more vertex. But here, this is R minus 1. V sub G now has, V sub J now has R plus 1 color, 1 vertices. And everything else has exactly R color, R vertices. So this is nearly equitable. And then, we know that, so here, now, this V sub J was accessible. Right? It was accessible before. What does it mean? There is vertex which has no neighbor to somewhere else, and no neighbor to somewhere else, no neighbor to somewhere else. So here, it has vertex no neighbor to here, and here another vertex which has no neighbor here, which has another vertex no neighbor here. There is this path. More importantly, because this was free class, there is this, this directed path in D, which doesn't pass through this VI. This was free, so that means in this VJ, we define this freeness, so that uh, without this VJ, so because this v, VI doesn't block anything, so there is path from here to V1, which doesn't pass through here. So we can move one vertex, which has one larger, to here, 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 to get near I mean, equitable coloring in here. So, since VI was free in the original coloring, VJ still remains accessible under F prime. Hence, DF has a path from VI to V1. without passing through, without containing VI, P, sorry, VJ to V1. So, G has a equitable coloring in A and B has an yeah, equitable A color. So we took care of the left part. Then what about right part? So because we, I mean, so if this y was in here, then we were happy. But y could be here, right? Then now here it has size r minus one and it has size r plus one. Everyone thing else has r. So still we have to take care of here. But what we know is that this is not accessible. And these are all accessible. What does it mean is that if there is a vertex 
say G here, if this has no neighbor here, then in this auxiliary graph, I mean, if, if this has no neighbor here, then we could have moved this to here, right? That means there is an edge in this directed graph from here to here, and this is accessible, so we can find the path from here to here, and then from there to V1. So which is not good for our definition. That means this has an edge here. So if you choose an arbitrary vertex in here, then has an edge here, and here, and here, and every single class here, accessible class here, it has an edge, 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 edge. In other words, it has not many edges inside of here. So, for G, which is in B, has, so let's say this is BS, which is B, as BS is inaccessible, G has a neighbor in all in each piece of I with did I use the same character? So A, B, C, D, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, P. Yeah. B, P with a P in between 1 and A. So that means that, so its degree of this vertex inside of this B, so number of its edges in its neighbors in B is number of I mean, it's degree minus a, at least a. And we know that this is strictly smaller than k. Oh, sorry. At most. This is strictly smaller than k. So this is, and k is a plus b. This is strictly smaller than b. And we said that we took a minimum counter example, and this is smaller graph. So, G, B, minus Y. So, if we kick out Y here. This has an equitable B coloring. Say, G prime. Did we already use G prime? Yeah, F prime. So, this F prime together with G prime gives an equitable K coloring of G. So which proves the claim. So that claim will be useful for us to deal with the to get the final contradiction. And <clears throat> there is one more fact need. So I will not prove this. So I will leave this as an exercise. This proof is quite similar to this claim three, but only, only slightly more complicated. So I think you can do it. So another case is that even if, okay, so I will write it and then, uh, no, 5.4. So if we have two solo edges, xy and xy prime are both solo edges. So two solo edges collapse then, I mean, and having x at the same, I mean, end point. But x is non-movable. And y, y prime is not an edge. Then G has an 
equitable take coloring. With has sorry has a near equitable K coloring with more accessible vertex class. Then A. So. I will leave it as an exercise. So because we assume that F has the fewest inaccessible classes, so that means it has the largest number of accessible classes. So it says that if we have two solo edge, which has no neighbor, no edges between Y and Y prime, and then they share one endpoint in here, then we can get a contradiction. So what you do is, so I wrote a hint here. So we move y to here and add x to here. So one of y here and x here, and then you play with it, and you can show that uh, you can still get a nearly equitable k coloring. But now only more vertex classes are accessible. So I will assume this. So now we can. Now what we will do is, in any case, we get one of these two situations. Either we have one solo edge with movable x, or two solo edge having the same end vertex here, so that the, these are independent, I mean, these are non-edge. So let's consider two cases. Case one is when a prime is smaller than B. <clears throat> so, let's say that we have this PJ. Okay. So, what we want to do is in this case we will show that we can find the solo edge with one vertex at the end movable. So what we want to do is we want to choose some vj and then we will divide it into two. Say u and u prime and this u is defined as a vertices which are which have some say some solo edge. So this is solo edge means that Y only has neighbor here and nowhere else. So this is incident to some solo edge. So something like this. No this is okay, okay. And then these are the vertices which is not incident to any solo edge. So that means if we have some edge here, then that y must have one more edge here. So these are the vertices which is incident to solo edge, and these are the vertices which are not incident to solo edge. And what we want to prove is, we want to prove one of these vertices is movable. When does it become movable? If it has no edges to one of these accessible class. Just one graph, one vertex. Uh, we want just one vertex which has no neighbor to here or no neighbor to here, so one of these. If you want to show that it exists, each vertex has bounded maximum degree. So we want to show that this vertex doesn't send much edges in this part. So to prove that, we want to show that uh, this, uh, this vertex sends lots of edges to that part. In total, we want to show that this sends quite lots of edges to here. 
then that gives us the upper bound on the number of edges from here to this part. And we can enforce one vertex to have no edges to one part. <coughs> so that's our strategy. Then for that, if we want to bound the number of edges from here to here, we can just bound the number of these vertices. Because this vertex doesn't send any more edges to here. So this number of blue edges is same as these vertices. So you want to show that there are lots of these things. In other words, there are lots of, I mean, there are not many these vertices which are not end of this blue edge. So we can, so to show that there are lots of this blue vertex, we want to bound the number of this red thing which is out of this blue. So to do that, <coughs> so for that purpose, we want it to choose this J widely. So that the, this vertice has lots of neighbors to here. So for that, we know that this is not free. So by definition, these are not free and these are free. So that means this blocks some of class here. This blocks some class. Let's say that class is BJ. So this blocks BJ. And one more thing is that uh, we can assume that the uh, all of these accessible classes has a neighbor to the left so that, the, so that the these are free and these are not, I mean, these are not free, but we can assume that the, it has passed from left to left to left to V1, so it doesn't go back to free. <coughs> and this vertex is blocked by this means, so this class is blocked by this, is if we take arbitrary vertex inside of here, it has neighbor here, 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 everything. So I just said that uh, inside of this here, there is a path from right to left only. So if this has no neighbor here, then we can move it here, right? So in direct left, there is a edge from here to here, and here, we can go directly to left. In that case, this doesn't block. So, so that means this blocks, this BJ means every vertex here has a neighbor in every classes here. So by choosing that, we can ensure that there are lots of edges to go in here. So it's better, I mean, we know how, much, how many edges it sends to here, so it's better to analyze the, it, I mean, better to play with the number of, I mean, blue edges or red edges. So, so we assume that uh, it should be 2 to the A minus A prime has lower index neighbor in this digraph D. And the set, V A minus A prime blocks something. Class, say, V sub J. With V sub J is free. Free and accessible. Then, for each x in this piece of J, we have its degree to A with at least A minus A prime minus 1. Because it has edge to every single class from 1 to A minus A prime minus 1. So right before this. Because this block here.
sense, we have a bound on this number of vertices to B is less than K minus A minus A prime. So degree of X is at most K minus 1. Let's write it this way. K minus 1 minus A minus A prime minus 1. Then this is K is A prime plus B. So we have B plus A prime, which is at most 2B. So by using this, we will, I mean, show that uh, these blue vertices are, there are many blue vertices. For that, let's define U to be vertices in B sub J such that X is incident to a solo edge. And U prime be the remaining. So, now we want to show that uh, this, there are this many this blue vertex, which means there are not so many this red vertex, and I mean, so out, outside of blue, so which is red vertex. Then, let M be the number of edges joining U prime and B, then we get M is at most 2B U prime. Because we just show that the number of, so all these vertices has at most 2B neighbors in here. That's what this says. So we add them, then we get this upper bound on M. And on, other, on the other hand, we know that all the vertices here has an edge to U prime. Then it has at least two edges to U prime. So say P minus, say, the neighbor of U intersection B. So in the print out, we, I wrote that the N, G, U, semicolon B, but we define this as a common neighbor. So we should change it into this, this notation. So let's say not in B, we just take the, all the, this outside, so not B. Then all of them, this doesn't send any edge to, this send at least two edge to there, so. Has at least two neighbors in U prime. So M is at least two times size of B minus size of this one, the neighbor of U, intersection B. So these are the exactly blue part. So from U, we take its neighbor here, then we get this. So that gives us a lower bound, right? So, okay, let me repeat it. So we take, yes, okay, let me, re so what I just said was slightly misleading. So, okay, so these are solo edges. And then, let's say, This is non solo edge. So this is not solo edge, this is not solo edge. 
but we still want to count this vertex because this contributes this edge and this loose edge, that's, that's what it matters. We want these vertices to lose lots of edges to B so that it has, we can find some class that, that this doesn't have edge here, right? So we want to take these blue vertices and then we want to show that there are many these blue vertices and then outside of that, let's say these yellow vertices are the one that doesn't have any neighbor here. And it's, so if it has a one neighbor here, then it should have two neighbors here because, because, I mean, this is not solo edge. That means there is one more edge and that cannot go to here because this is not blue. So that's more accurate. So what I just said before, it was a bit misleading. So from that, we get this lower bound because from here to here, I mean, we just count these edges then yeah, so all of them sends two edges to there. So this and this together give us this uh, so two B U prime is at least two times, so we delete two, we just cancel out two, then that's this B minus the this. So now we use it to actually bound the number of edges from here to accessible parts. So we will use that. So we add all the degrees of x to a to accessible parts for all vertices x in u. Then we can upper bound this. So each vertex has its degree at least k minus 1, at most k minus 1. And there are u vertices. And then it might send some edges to here, to b. How many edges at least does it send? Number of these blue parts, which is size of ng1 u intersection b. So each, so that counts each this blue edge. It might send more edge like this red edge, but still it's upper bound. Yeah, we might have to subtract more to get the equality, but this is still larger. And we know that k is a plus b, so this is a minus one u plus b u, and we have this. This formula. And then we know that the u and u prime together has size r. u and u prime together has size r. So this is a minus 1 u plus br minus u prime minus n to the 1 sub g of u intersection with b. And we see that uh, here, so B. So that's exactly, so this part, so minus that plus that. So that part is from here, we get B U prime plus NG1 U B1 is at least B. So this is upper bounded by replacing that to B. And we know that what's the size of B? Everything has size R, and one thing has size R plus 1. So it's B R plus 1. 
So this is a minus 1 times u minus 1. So from here to here, so it doesn't send any h to b sub j itself. So here we have a minus 1 classes. <coughs> So, there is one vertex here, which sends less than a minus 1 as is to here. That means there is one vertex which sends at most a plus a minus 2, so it must skip one class. Then that is movable. And it is movable and it's instant to solo it. So we are done. So, that's the number of vertices here, right? And there are B classes. And all of them have size R, except the last one has size R plus 1. So, this is BR plus 1. So, that finishes the first case. And the second case is easier. So, it's going to be shorter, so hang in for a moment. So the other case is when B is actually smaller than A prime, but equality doesn't really matter. And in that case, what we want to do is we want to find this two solo edge, Y and Y prime, are non-adjacent, which shares one end. We want to find that. And how we want to find that is we want to take an independent set, and for each independent set, we count its solo edges. So we want to take on independent set i in here and then for each y we count the number of solo edges it sends out and then if it sends out so many solo edges then they must coincide at one point then we are done so we in order to do that we take a, let i be a maximum independent set. In P, then we know that uh, it has so it's at least r plus one because this is self is independent set. So there should be a bigger one. So for each y, let sigma of y be the number of solo edges incident to y. Then what we have is we can actually count it in terms of a and a prime and its degree to a. Then what we have is its degree to of this y to the accessible classes is actually a plus a prime minus number of solo edge. So what it means is that uh, this is inaccessible, so it has neighbor in each of these classes, which is not free. And then here, <coughs> okay, so, okay, let me say it again. So this is inaccessible, that means that it has one edge to every A classes. Here. And then out of these three classes, if it's, it either sends solo edge here, or if it doesn't send solo edge, then it must send at least two edge here. So all the non-solo edge, we get additional. So, so it sends one to everyone, every class, but it sends two if that is not solo edge. So if 
Okay, let's do it this way. If it doesn't send any solo edge, then 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, we get A prime. But if it sends one solo edge, then 1, everything else 2. So A prime minus 1, so we can get this lower bound. So we can bound the number of solo edge by A prime plus A minus this degree to A, which is at least A prime minus B plus degree of this into B plus 1. Because degree, so if you add this into here, add this into here, then we get A plus B at least degree of G Y to A and degree of Y to B. So this is just degree and this is K. So we get oh, this one. This is K, this is degree plus one. So we get this. So it says that uh, it sends some neighbors to here, but sends additional edges to, I mean, yeah, anyway, so this gives us a lower bound on number of solo edges. And then we are almost done. So, oh yeah, before that, let me, let's say one more thing. As i is maximal, what we know is that it's for all i, for all y in i, we add its degree plus 1, and that's bigger than b. Because we have i, and we take one vertex. This is maximal independent set. We take its neighbor. We count them, one, two, three, four, five. How many we count? It's degree plus one inside of B. And here we count one, two, three, four. And we keep doing that. Then what if there is one vertex left which is not, never counted? Then this has no edge to I. If there is an edge to this vertex, then we count this when we count the, this vertex and its neighbor. So this is never counted. If this is never counted, then I with this vertex get forms a larger independent set, which is a contradiction. So this must count every vertex. Maybe some vertex counted twice, but it should count all, so we get this inequality. So from that, now we are done. As if you compute the, for all y in this independent set, if we add the number of solo edge, then this gives us that the, we have to add this number. So a prime minus b times size of i plus size of sum of degree of y in b plus 1 for all y i, and we just said that this is at least b. So a prime minus b times i, uh, <coughs> plus b r plus 1. So this is at least that. And we know that i is at least r, so this is at least a prime r minus b, b r plus b r plus 1 is a prime r plus 1. But number of free vertices here is at most a prime r. So what does it mean? That means there are two vertices in i which should send solo edges and they should be sent to the same vertex. So we get, in that case, exercise 5.4 says that we can obtain an equitable coloring, so we are done. So before finishing it, let me add some remark. Let's delete this. So this shows that uh, this proved the degree condition on G 
so that uh, we can embed this H, which is the joint union of this clique. So as I mentioned, we can just take the complement of it, and we find the minimum, minimum degree condition on G, which guarantees this. Then next general question is, what if we consider more general graph than H, and then this, more general graph H than this? Of course, H should have bounded maximum degree. Otherwise, I mean, otherwise, I mean, H should be sparse. Otherwise, so we cannot really embed dense graph into something else. So there is something called Borobash Eldridge Catling conjecture, which says that uh, if G and H has uh, M vertex, and minimum degree of G is at least 1 minus 1 over maximum degree of H plus 1, N, then H embeds into G. But this is conjecture, so it's not proven. However, Sauer and Sosser proved that, uh, I mean, a bit weaker bound hold. So instead of that, if we have a stronger condition, 1 minus 1 over 2 delta H n minus 1, then H contains G. So H embedded into G. And a few years, few years ago, the Kotochka and U and Kaur, so this is uh, so there is this additional two here, right? The Kotoshika and Yuan Kaur show that uh, instead of that, we can prove this. If this holds, then so theorem, Kaur Kotoshika U show that this then is embedded to G. So this is wide open problem, so you can think about it. So it's an interesting problem. And what we will do tomorrow is that, uh, okay, this is for really general graph. But in this case, we could prove this theorem because, I mean, it has this special structure. Then what was that? structure that made it special. So why we were able to embed this wire, we cannot do general thing. So actually, the reason was that this has very bounded degree. So it's bound, 